On the 4th of July, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted in Philadelphia. British colonial rule was thrust aside and the United States of America came into being. Well over two centuries later, what is the nature of the relationship between the faded British Empire and its one-time American colony? Is it an alliance of equals or does one dominate the other? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Many today associate the term special relationship with George W. Bush and Tony Blair, the then British Prime Minister's unreserved support of the former U.S. President's international policies, defined an alliance that many in reality saw as one-off, follow your leader. But it was decades ago that a wartime British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, first coined the phrase, this in appreciation of the U.S. entering Britain's war against Germany and Japan. In the years that followed, it's an alliance that has ebbed and flowed. In 1956, the British Prime Minister Anthony Eden backed the French and Israelis in their invasion of Egypt, aimed at seizing control of the Suez Canal. U.S. President Ike Eisenhower was not consulted and he was furious. In the fallout, it was the British Prime Minister who was forced to resign and it became clear that the age of the British Empire was over. But the relationship restored to its sense of warmth between an elderly British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, who politically mentored a vibrant young President, John F. Kennedy. Then Vietnam and the friendship hit troubled times when Harold Wilson declined U.S. President Lyndon Johnson's request to send British troops to support the U.S. forces. Warmth renewed when Britain's first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, found in Ronald Reagan an unlikely soulmate. She called him the second most important man in her life after her husband, Dennis. The close personal relationship was echoed in that between Tony Blair and Bill Clinton, each essentially a new breed of politician who shared a common sensibility nurtured in what was called the swinging 60s. But Blair's relationship with George W. Bush was of a different order. His government's unquestioning support of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, a particular point of contention, and called into question a relationship that many in the British public now believe has had only negative consequences. Oh, joining us to discuss the topic, in Washington, D.C., Christopher Chivers, a political scientist at the RAND Corporation. In London, Alan Mendoza, co-founder and executive director of the Henry Jackson Society. And in Paris, Thomas Clow, head of the European Council on Foreign Relations in Paris. Well, the Obama administration, which tends to choose its words very carefully, has continually used the word partnership rather than relationship in characterizing its alliance with the UK. Uh, Christopher Chivers in Washington, is there a particular significance in this semantics? Well, I wouldn't make too much of, of these words. I mean, I think that the uh, special relationship has to be put in the context of the broader transatlantic relationship, uh, which I think is basically very strong. The basic relationship between the United States and Europe, between the United States and the UK, is very strong in terms of trade, political ties, common history, uh, and common culture. Now, we have seen some frictions uh, in the relationship, uh, but these frictions uh, are almost exclusively over how to deal with problems elsewhere in the world. And I think that the fact that the United States and Europe are, are even discussing these issues elsewhere in the world is just a reflection of, of how deep and how strong the transatlantic relationship is. So that's a long way of saying that I wouldn't put too much stock in, in these small changes uh, in semantics. Alan Mendoza, your view of semantics between partnership and relationship? Well, I think there's probably a little more to it than uh, Christopher may have uh, um, put down to. I mean, the, the, the view over here is very different. I think w uh, we've been rather alarmed by the rhetoric coming out of Washington towards the uh, special relationship over the past uh, a few months of the Obama administration. Um, certainly, yes, there remains a commitment, of course, to Europe. But um, it's quite clear that um, in the language used towards Britain, some of the actions that have occurred towards Britain, certainly and particularly under the uh, Brown-Obama relationship, um, there's been a sort of change 
change of thought in Washington as to how it views Britain and indeed its European allies full stop, it wouldn't perhaps be too far to say that the uh, administration has somewhat downgraded its European uh, ties in, in favour of looking elsewhere around the world. That said, it's uh, a new uh, Prime Minister here in Britain and there are early signs that uh, perhaps the administration is changing its tune on that and uh, would like to assess that a bit further. Well, Thomas Carl, in, in Paris, um, President Obama has referred a lot to the European Union, a phrase that many previous U.S. presidents have not always used. Is he perhaps shifting his attention from that specific relationship with Britain to a wider one with Europe in general? Well, I think that's, that's right in a sense. And as you just said, uh, President Obama is acutely aware, uh, if you want to put it that way, of the existence of the European Union. And indeed, it was a little noted fact, but I thought very striking, that in one of the earlier uh, pre-presidential debates uh, in, the, in the primaries, when he hadn't secured the Democratic nomination yet, and when he was being asked who, if he did become president, nominee first and then president, his partner of choice would be, he said the European Union, which was rather an extraordinary thing, in a sense, if you like, for an American politician to say. He didn't even say Europe was the European Union. Now, I think what has happened since is that Obama and with him a large part of the administration have been really rather disappointed in the European Union not uh, sufficiently getting its act together, still trying to cr crowd the photo with too many European faces, and despite having finally adopted the Lisbon Treaty, which of course is supposed to give uh, Europe a single, a single voice, a single face, a, si a, more, a more united policy in terms of its engagement with the rest of the world and the United States, the reality, of course, uh, hasn't lived up to expectations. And I think what we're seen, seeing is, is signs of American frustration uh, with the Europeans um, and tough love, if you like. Well, Christopher Chivers in Washington, we heard a reference there to a new administration in the United Kingdom, uh, David Cameron coming into power. Is there the view from Washington that perhaps uh, this, a, perhaps a redefining of the relationship may be underway with the new British government? Well, I mean, I th I'd like to respond a little bit to what some of my colleagues have just said in London and in Paris. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it, on the one hand, uh, I, I disagree with the idea that President Obama is somehow uh, neglecting the special relationship in favor of a closer relationship with continental Europe. I do think that it's important to recognize that President Obama is, of course, very popular in continental Europe uh, and, and understands the potential role that the European Union uh, can play in the world. Uh, and for that reason has obviously uh, tried to focus to a certain degree on developing that relationship and continuing to deepening it, to deepen it. But nevertheless, I mean, when it comes to the main security challenges that we face in the, year, in, in the world, uh, particularly in South Asia, uh, it, it's still the British that are able to contribute uh, the most in terms of troops uh, and that tend to share the same uh, common view with the United States. So I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that somehow uh, at present or even under the Obama administration, there has been a shift away from uh, the U.K. towards Europe. Now, I do think that it is true, however, uh, that the United States is increasingly focused on problems elsewhere in the world and that some of these problems uh, may be of a character that our European allies, both British uh, and continental European, uh, are, are not able to contribute as much as uh, some in Washington would like. Thomas Clark, would you like to follow up on that? Uh, well, no, I think it's absolutely right. We are in a world which is rapidly changing. And even over the course of the last two years, we have seen countries like Brazil uh, deploying what you might could call a global diplomacy, Turkey becoming much more active in its own neighborhood and beyond, not, not, not unafraid to confront uh, uh, the, the, the world's major powers in terms of taking a different stance towards one of the most burning policies on the agenda, like Iran. So it is a changing world. Uh, I think the Obama administration is acutely aware of the fact that we've, we've entered a new historic era. We, we may be seeing all the end of 500 years of, if you like, Western dominance of the globe. And that is now, I think, coming to an end with new non-Western powers uh, being active on a global scale in a way that, that hasn't really happened for centuries. So it's a fundamental realignment which is going on. Britain, of course, uh, does have, in a sense, if you like, a special relationship with the U.S., which is founded partly on... Uh, very specific agreements to share intelligence, although uh, there have been many British disappointments about the Americans not always being as forthcoming with information as the British would like. Uh, 
techn important technicalities about um, uh, the British nuclear uh, defense uh, systems not being able to operate as independently as the French needing uh, American partnership. Um, um, and of course, there is the, the British readiness historically, uh, uh, or certainly in post-war history, uh, to, to uh, engage militarily overseas much more readily than all other um, EU, EU countries, EU partners, with the exception of France. But now, of course, Britain is entering into a period of severe budgetary constraints, as are many other countries. So that is an important part of the relationship, which we might see shifting with possible implications for the relationship between Washington and London. Well, Alan Mendoza, we, we heard mention there of um, issues such as the sharing of intelligence. But that, in a way, is, is a thing of the past. At one stage, um, U.S. intelligence sources refused to have anything to do with the British because of the leaking of secrets uh, to uh, the Soviet Union at that particular time, just one of the many stumbling blocks in the relationship. But this question of globalization, of a changing world order, to what extent in London is that change within the world as a whole uh, being recognized? Well, I think it, uh, just on your point about intelligence sharing, let's not forget uh, the U.S. had its own share of spy scandals, people like Aldrich James, on, on that uh, score. But uh, your more general point, yes, absolutely correct. People are aware of the change, uh, very much so. Firstly, in answer to some of the uh, previous uh, comments, I think um, there's a sense that Europe, indeed, having been at the forefront of global affairs from the period 1945 to 1990, in terms of being, the, if you like, the uh, world's battle line, where, where battle lines are drawn between the Soviets and the USA, this is no longer the case. Europe can cannot expect any more to be lavished attention on it just for being there, if you like. It has to bring something to the table. Um, my colleagues have commented on this already, but it's quite clear that if the Europeans do not um, up the ante, do not contribute more to defence, to joint initiatives around the world, there's no particular reason for the Americans to pay attention to them. Now, on the broader point of globalisation, um, yes, this is something very uh, aware in Britain. Just this week, William Hagar, new Foreign Secretary, made a first, um, if you like, address uh, uh, outlining his priorities and one thing he was very clear on was that Britain needed to chart its own course internationally it needed to restore perhaps neglected relationships it noted for example that there are rising powers around the world which Britain has historical ties to India for example or in fact the Gulf states who we need to reinvigorate our ties with and perhaps look a little bit further than the traditional transatlantic uh, scene if you like for um, extending our own great power status in the coming years so yes very much um, uh, aware of the globalization the world. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's pause here and uh, currently look at some of the issues defining the relationship between the US and the UK. They include the increasingly unpopular Afghan war as the two countries plan on an exit strategy, the fragile recovery of the global economy while the newly elected Prime Minister David Cameron backs budget cuts, President Bo Obama warns against them, concerned they could cause recession. And finally, BP's responsibility for the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and the blunt U.S. criticism on, of the uh, British company. Now, let's just take on this uh, last point in particular, Christopher Chivers. The criticism of BP has, to an extent, been seen as a criticism of Britain by many on that side of the Atlantic. Um, well, I think that, you know, it's it's important uh, not to underestimate the extent to which people are very frustrated uh, by what's happened with the oil spill. But I think it's also important to put it in the, the broader context of the global economic crisis, which is really weighing on, on everyone's minds, not only in the United States, of course, but also in Europe and around the world. And I think that when you have a, a, a problem or a disaster like the one that's taken place in the Gulf, uh, people's, uh, in the context of a global economic uh, crisis, naturally tensions are going to be a bit a bit higher. But I, I, I personally don't see this as, as being in the, in the medium term uh, any kind of a serious threat to uh, the special relationship. Well, Ellen Mendoza moving uh, past BP and focusing, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, on the differences in economic strategy. How fundamental are the differences between the Cameron government and the Obama administration? I just want to come back on the BP issue. Actually, it caused a lot of offence here because, as you well know, um, BP is a global company. It's got a, a large number of shareholders in the US. Um, it's not been called British Petroleum for a good decade. I think we in Britain felt a little... Um, 
uh, peeved, I think, that the president was using the name British Petroleum as a way of deflecting attention onto an external force. Yes, of course, a company um, has a lot to answer for, but the notion that it's a British company um, is erroneous in this context. Do you think, that this, was in, do you think that this was intentional on President Obama's behalf? Well, I think it was intentional. I think it was an attempt to divert away from a domestic issue. And I think it, uh, the debate's been framed in a rather unusual way. People have been saying the president, uh, this could be his you know, Hurricane Katrina moment. I, I think that's perhaps a bit silly given the difference in, uh, in focus. Um, I, I think what's happened here is that there's an external scapegoat. In this case, it happens to be a British, you know, original British company, and it's come out in that way. But I think it's quite clear the president did capitalize on the, if you like, the foreign nature of the company, even though, as we all know, all those oil companies drilling in that way operate to the same standards, but he's gone after them. They've obviously made a colossal error in terms of what they've done, but the way it's played out has not played well diplomatically. It's added to a, a series of small slights, uh, but I think that rhetoric's been reined back a bit. I think a conversation between David Cameron and President Obama um, ha has, has made some difference to that uh, status, and I think we've uh, seen a ramping down now of that sort of uh, British Petroleum sentiment. Uh, Thomas Clough, I'd, I'd like you to pick up on that particular point there, that the BP issue, for example, being used by a U.S. president, we've heard uh, uh, described there as his uh, Katrina moment and a bid to take attention away by focusing attention on another country, in this case, uh, the U.K. Uh, to what extent do you believe there's validity in this Well, uh, it's obviously a very emotional issue for, for many people, especially in America. And, and um, from a European perspective, um, it would seem that a lot of the cr criticism uh, that Obama has been President Obama has been subjected to is, is, is indeed rather unfair. Um, this is, this is a, a, a type of event that he obviously cannot control. Uh, and there's no question that the administration has done everything it can. Uh, to push uh, towards finding a solution uh, and, and containing the damage as, as best we can. So I think the comparison, again, looking at it from a European point of view, um, with, with the Katrina uh, devastation and, and, and the, the slow response from authorities then, or what was perceived as being a slow response, especially federal authorities, it seems, does seem rather unfair. And there's probably a lot of partisanship involved. But, but again, this is a European look at something that's going on in America. What, of course, is very telling uh, is that President Obama uh, hasn't hesitated uh, to, to indeed inject a sort of national uh, angle, a national perspective, a, national, a bit of national venom, if you like, into, into his defense strategy. Uh, and that in itself is revealing because it does show that in the world we live in today, uh, even in the context of, of a relationship that is still in many ways quite special, such as the uh, American-British one, um, uh, uh, there, are, there are so many factors to take into account that that emotions, nostalgia, uh, war feelings of sort of traditional diplomatic warmth uh, will not, in fact, uh, will not, in fact, deflect or stop that kind of that kind of, uh, if you like, small dose of venom being injected into into what is essentially a PR, a political PR line of defence. And and I think that in, that in itself is a reflection that uh, yes, Europe is no longer central, can no longer be absolutely central. Uh, to, to, if you like, the American public polit political discourse in its look at the outside world. America has now many other issues to look at internationally. China, of course, being first and foremost in, uh, I think, everybody's mind in the Western world. Well, Ella Mendoza in, in London, certainly an age of uh, pragmatism, it would appear. But to get back to that point about the differences in economic approach by the Cameron government and by the Obama administration, are these fundamental differences or are they rooted in what we just heard, a sense of emotion, a sense of uh, being different from the other side? Well, no, I think there's purely a, a difference of political philosophy. In Britain, we have a, uh, it's a, it's a coalition government, but it's a majority conservative coalition. These are conservative economic principles being put into action. President Obama, of course, is a Democrat. He comes from the left of politics. I think you're seeing nothing more than um, a difference in political philosophy that would be um, uh, the same whether two different characters were in uh, office in Britain and America from different parties. So I don't see it as being reflective of the relationship as such. I see it reflective of differing political philosophies. Christopher Chivers in Washington. Let's move on to the question of Afghanistan. Um, we've had mention before of a degree of belief in the U.S. that Europe in general and the U.K. in particular has not always come to assist in the way that the U.S. might have hoped. The issue of Afghanistan. 
How much is this defining the relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. at present and in the recent past? Well, I think it's obviously very important. Uh, Afghanistan is a major priority for the Obama administration. Uh, and I think that there probably was, at first, fairly high hopes that uh, with the new administration in place, our European allies would uh, increase uh, very significantly their troop uh, and aid contributions in Afghanistan. Uh, and while we've seen some increases, uh, I think that we probably haven't seen uh, the, 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 the size uh, increases that uh, people in the administration would have liked. Um, so I do think it's true. Uh, th there, there is a bit of a letdown. Um, and I think that this is something that could impact uh, the future of U.S.-European relations when it comes to dealing with other parts of the world. Um, but I don't think it's going to impact the basic U.S.-European relationship that I referred to at first, which is defined in terms of uh, economics, uh, common history, uh, and common values. Alan Mendoza, uh, to follow on the point about Afghanistan, Iraq has left a definite scar in the British uh, psyche. Uh, the the uh, investigations into the war have been very critical of the Blair administration and in some ways very anti the U.S. Is there still a sense of anger at uh, the whole Iraq scenario in which the U.K. was brought in by the U.S.? Well, it's quite unclear as to how exactly the UK was brought in by the US. I mean, we've seen some of the conversations between Blair and Bush come out. Um, we, you know, none of us have seen the uh, raw intelligence as to what was being seen. It's quite clear that something went badly wrong in that uh, process. The UK did, of course, come into the war. And, of course, the implementation of the war was a, uh, was a disaster in terms of how it unfolded. Now, of course, in retrospect, if you look back now, Iraq finally has, has come of age, if you like, in terms of becoming a functioning democracy. It's been very painful to get there and I don't think anyone would have um, wanted this kind of process to get to that but um, looking at what's happened right now there has at least been a sense of progress um, within Iraq now that said it does it has had a severe effect on relations here between how uh, the US is viewed and how the relationship is viewed of course it has um, certainly Iraq remains a raw wound particularly in the Labour Party where even now uh, Labour are in the process of electing a new leader a lot of that vote will depend on an Iraq war you know uh, sort of theory how did that person vote on the Iraq war how did they uh, what, what part did they play in that process it's something that the front runner David Miliband who was of course in the cabinet uh, will have to look out for very carefully so the if you like the wound is very raw still um, how it plays out in Afghanistan is different it's simply a case of is the strategy working can we win this war and this of course with the, uh, the whole event surrounding McChrystal and the appointment of Petraeus um, notions of withdrawal timetables this is very much up in the air and I think the British public um, are going to give very little very short shrift if you like to a new strategy given that we've been already there for nine years and there's been no progress they you know they need to see some success and they need to see it quickly Thomas Clower brief uh, final thought uh, on a wider issue and that is the warmth of the relationship between the US and the UK despite everything we've discussed the differences does it remain is it still there from a European point of view as well well, something is still there, of course, and that's something important, but it's always been ambiguous. Uh, you know, look at Hollywood. They often get it right, and it's, I think, one of the most striking facts that uh, Hollywood villains, I think, speak more often in either a French or a British accent than in a German accent, which, if you look at the history of the last 70 years, is, is, is astonishing. So certainly from an American point of view, there are, there are feelings that are often more ambiguous than that sort of rather simple catchphrase, special relationship. Well, would, thank you uh, so would, much would to our and guests, the same goes for Christopher Chibbers in Washington, D.C., Alan Mendoza in London, and Thomas Clough in Paris. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. And to all those celebrating Independence Day, a happy 4th of July. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now. Thank you.